I, I don't know what thinking cinematically is because I, th I, I sort of feel like y you've just got to, you know, do what you do, which is to write beautifully and engage us as readers and we will imagine that in our heads and that will become cinematic. So I, I, otherwise I, I don't quite, you know, like, you know, I, I don't know what that means, whether, you know, I don't, I don't think you should write more landscapes because landscapes are kind of boring, you know, in words, you know, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Tony. I think honour the medium that you're in. You know, um, like, like he was saying earlier, there, you know, that internal wonderful creation is just something that is so beautiful in a novel and you wouldn't want to not do that um, because you were, you know, hoping for some other medium. Like, yeah. And as a writer, I was really surprised and heartened about how little of the writer's room is about what happens visually, because in a way that's for the art department and the director who come in later in the game to decide how it's going to be shot and how it's going to be edited and what a set's going to look like. And in fact, in the writer's room, it's, um, it's actually the tools of the novelist that we come back to all the time, character, um, who is this person? And it, one of the most gratifying things about a writer's room is how much you learn about each other a lot of it's like, this reminds me of my mum and this story that happened, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh my God, let's take that emotion and invest it into that scene or that situation as well. Like I'm working in another um, brainstormers room at the moment and it's about, um, it's about high school. And it's just most of the day is just <laughs> us talking about our high school experiences. Just your own life. Basically, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> So it's all about those fundamentals. Very little of it is discussing, you know, sometimes you're like, actually, that's a really funny joke and we can see how it will play out on the screen. But that's just a, that's just a bonus. It's not the main discussion at all. Um, just one thing to add to that though, when, um, when you read Ben's scripts, um, because he is, um, you know, such a beautiful prose writer, um, sometimes my favourite bits of the scripts were, you know, were the dialogue in between. <laughs> that, you know, no one will ever hear because the way he describes things are, are, is so lovely. Okay, so when I was writing my memoir, I already knew that the family members, the characters who appear in the book were going to be funny because, like, my family are the funniest people I know. They are ridiculous, they're absurd, they're tragic in a lot of ways. Like I was saying before, I think the line for me between comedy and tragedy is quite fine. Maybe that's been informed by growing up in this particular family as well. But you know that scene that you guys saw earlier where my mum is describing in graphic terms what happened during childbirth with me? Like, if you hear the real story, it's even more graphic than that. But that's, when I wrote that in the book, that was pretty much lifted line for line from the story she tells me every time I have a birthday. Her SMSs now, like and on all of them. And she also tells that to pretty much anyone who's... You've heard it, you've like heard it. I mean, yeah, it's like she refers to our birthdays as Labor Day um, <laughs> and because it's about her and she's not expecting, like, as much as she's giving us a birthday hello, she's expecting gratitude and thanks, as I think more mothers should, frankly. Um, so I didn't have to exaggerate much because I just had to say in matter-of-fact terms, this is what my mum's like. So when you see that scene on screen, that's just me actually taking from the book what I've taken from real life. Yeah, I didn't need to exaggerate. And if I did exaggerate, I think it would have been too much. And, oh, sorry. I'm going to add to that. that. One of the things that we were really aware of in um, doing that as, uh, in, on the script term too was keeping that true voice and making the characters believable, isn't it, Tony? We kept coming Absolutely. back to that yeah. and, you know, yeah. You know, when we were talking about adaptation before when you were talking about how adaptation works, it just made me think we knew from day one that we were going to depart from the book. Because, as I said, the structure of the book, there is no structure. It hops between time. That doesn't work for TV. And very early on, we honed in on the heart of the story we wanted to tell, at least for this season, which was a marriage on its last legs over one summer, which is just like that much of the book in some ways, but it informs the rest of the book. Um, and then we just kept on exploring and mining. And a lot of the stuff that you see on screen is fictionalised. Like, yes, I totally wanted to be like a TV star when I grew up and it wasn't going to happen. Um, but, you know, I never dressed up in a watermelon costume or anything <laughs> like that. But funnily enough, one of the other things that happened, and it reminds me of um, 
When David Hare, the British playwright and screenwriter, when he was adapting The Hours by Michael Cunningham, which is, you know, one of those perfect miracles of a novel, but, oh, my God, it's all internal. Like, how is anyone ever going to adapt to that? And I think that adaptation, that script, is one of the most amazing adaptations. But David Hare said in an interview when um, he met Michael Cunningham, he said the same thing that Christos Chocker said to you guys, which was just go for it, just be... Just make it your thing. And his take was that you can only achieve fidelity to the text with great promiscuity. <laughs> and I think that's sort of what we've done with our book as well. And funnily enough, one of the scenes that I think is so much at the core of the show, which is essentially when Danny gets kicked out, that moment that you see in the trailer, that, that happened in real life. Like my mum did kick my dad out of home, essentially. And even though my book is about that period, what's really weird is that it's not in the book. Mm -hmm. And in writing the show, we actually had to mine into harder truths that maybe I just didn't want to touch or somehow missed in my mid-twenties when I was writing the book. And it became a greater representation of truth, again, through that sort of playing around with, with what actually happened. Well, obviously the screenplay that's already adapted the book is a much more economical proposition for us. Honestly, I think that's why the medium of television is going through its golden age at the moment. The, the, particularly in America, the writer's room is such a standard procedure. And, it, you know, when it works well, I think we've all experienced how, how empowering it can be. And, I mean, it can also uh, not work. You know, it can also be not much fun. I've, I've experienced that as well. And, uh, but, where, but at its best, it really brings out the best in people. Yeah, I mean, one of the arts of producing um, is, is putting the team together. Um, so, you know, I think it also comes back to the quality of the work, you know, to get an amazing screenplay that's an adaptation, like Tony says, that's, that's great, the work's been done, but um, to look at the work, to think about, you know, what screenwriter would be right, you know, what support they need around them, you know, whether it's a TV or, you know, a TV series or um, or not, you know, all of those things are also, there is joy in them as well. Um, so I certainly wouldn't, if you're, if you've got a great novel, but you're not a confident screenwriter, wouldn't feel any obligation to feel that you need to do that work. Um, that is, that is part of the joy of producing. And, and at Matchbox, um, we use a, a model that is one, Tony is one of them, and I, I say that they're the rock stars of Matchbox. They're the showrunners, so they're a producer, but they're a producer that hold and defend the story, and they really like, and that's what Sophie Miller was on Family Law, and um, you know, anyway, I just think that's a really, I think that's also part of why there's a you know a, a golden age of television now because we're really valuing story um, correctly, and yeah. So we had all the scripts in third or fourth draft, or third draft. We hadn't done the production polish. Um, we were fully financed. So, um, and we were probably only three months out from our shoot date when we started casting, or maybe maybe four months actually, because we knew to cast the family law, it was going to be a really big search. We were looking for um, Chinese, Australian actors. Um, some of them needed to speak Cantonese. You know, there's not, just because of the issue that, that um, Tony raised earlier, that we don't see those faces in our screens. It wasn't like, you know, when you're looking for a, a white actor, you can kind of go, okay, well, these are the, you know, these are the names. We really had to kind of find new talent, which is fantastic, um, but it was a big challenge. So yeah, so that happens quite late in the process. NBC, you are a, a television distribu distributor, so, uh, you know, duly in my day jobs are to provide um, things for them to distribute. Uh, Matchbox, we still make films. Um, we, you know, we, we've, again, it, you, you, it's a balance between the business side of it and the, the uh, passion side of it. Like, I think we're still passionate about making films. Uh, so we are doing something like Ali's Wedding, which is, you know, Australia's first all-Muslim rom-com. It's like, um, you know, and the reason we want to do it is because I think it's um, 
the you know again like the family law it, it's a very political film without being political in the slightest way and and um, Don McAlpine is shooting it and he you know basically um, thinks it's one of the most important films he's ever shot and it's also the lowest budget thing he's shot in 40 years so you know we we it is a kind of, it's always balancing the passion versus the the business side of it but certainly there are there are bigger audiences for television now C cinema is is tough and especially if you're going to make you want to make something that's a bit difficult uh, like it, it is harder i think the films that have really tracked this year have been the the happier films the the more uplifting films that that seems to be what Australian audiences want to go to the cinema for? I mean, it, it takes a lot longer to get a film up than it does a television series on the whole, doesn't it, Tony? It's because like, the financing is so complicated. So different. Um, yep. Well, sorry, just on that, whereas with television, if you get a network attached to your TV series, which can happen in development stages, it, it, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to get greenlit, but that really breaks the back of the finance. Um, and unlocks it. Whereas, you know, film is a lot more, a lot yeah. more difficult where the money comes from. The thing we have to remember about a screenplay is that it's actually a selling document. It's the reason that you write a screenplay is to convince people to give you the money to then go and employ actors and a director and all the resources that you need. Um, to then fil film, film screenplays don't exist as an end in themselves, and so what you're writing it for is uh, uh, you're usually writing it for people who are very time poor. Um, so, <laughs> honestly, anything that is really dense and difficult to read uh, will tend to go further down the pile. Um, anything that reads and uh, is a page turner that. Uh, gives you a lot a whole range of um, clear clearly articulated images and actions will uh, grab your attention much more quickly uh, and um, and I think I think that that that's that's is part of the skill of, of uh, screen <laughs> screenwriting it, it is about a clarity and particularity in use of language in television, as Ben said, is a team sport. So, you know, when you just write Chinese restaurant, um, your designer is probably going to have read the book. Um, they're going to have a vision that, you know, has been discussed with the team. And I think part of allowing the other voices to bring it to life is letting them interpret what that is. Um, and hopefully they understand the project and it's, it's true to the story. Um, another really interesting thing they say about, about um, screen is that you write something three times. You write it in the script, you write it when you shoot it, and then you write it when you edit it. So there's, there's lots of changes in, the, in that process. Again, the skill of uh, the screenwriter is understanding how to evoke emotion. And often uh, emotion is what is evoked by what's not said. Uh, that rather than what, what is said, um, it's kind of, in a way, it's almost the opposite of uh, prose writing. It's, it's, it's actually about distillation and creating space and also remembering that um, the final product is going to be seen by, by an audience and so it's actually what the audience will be able to read. Again, if I get, you know, I'm working on a screenplay with a writer um, and they write a whole bunch of stuff, which actually I know an actor can't translate and, um, uh, and an audience won't read, I will point out that in, in that screenplay that, you know, an actor won't be able to translate that, an audience won't be able to read that. What you've got to do is create, I mean, I've been tremendously moved by screenplays, but not necessarily by big print and not even by dialogue, but by understanding scenario, understanding context, understanding uh, how drama is created and creating stakes by things that are that that uh, by things that are not said. So I think that that they are all the the great skills of screenwriting. And you you can and and I guess a little bit of the maison scene as well. Uh, you yeah. know, like yeah. you know, um, we cut 
to, you know, Jenny watching him in the corner. Yeah. Um, you know, she, she sighs and walks away. You, you know, maybe that captures, you know, what would be a couple of paragraphs in your book. And, uh, and just quickly, like, uh, this has been a total crash course. Like, it's been a masterclass over the last five years. And, you know, Tony would sometimes give me really handy hints when he knew I was really struggling at some points. And uh, one of the great tips that you gave me at one point was, look, when you're struggling to write a scene, just write it down in prose, like how you normally write it, and then translate that as a script. Because when you've written it as prose, then you probably understand your character better because what you're doing with a script is you're providing cues and blueprints for the other people working on it so for instance i'm not the art director but i'm just going to say this scene it's like this house has been was once a display home and it's been worn down by years of human erosion and it's sort of like do with that what you will and but then with with some of the scenes like i'm not going to write what's going on in the actor's brain because they have to communicate them themselves but then sometimes you're using the rhythm of of the screenplay like there's one scene where Jenny is sort of eavesdropping on a phone call and she hears something that's brutal and the dialogue's written and then all I need to write for Jenny is, it hurts. That's it. And the actor does the rest. I, I think uh, the, the form, it was kind of eight chapters from eight different points of view which move narratively forward. So uh, that, uh, if you're, basically if you're gonna turn the slap into a, uh, a, film, a feature film, like a two hour feature film, two and a half hour feature film, it would have been um, a film about a court case, you know, about a kid being slapped in a court case. And that's actually the least interesting thing about the, about the book. The, the most interesting thing about the book is the way that that event affects all of these different people's lives in different ways and the way it talks about um, social mores and, and the way, also the way it exposes that we can live, we can be in a, in a social situation with a group of people and all have very different opinions about, you know, uh, you know it's all about moral ambiguity and those things could not be explored in a, a rich and complex way as, uh, as a feature film. It would have been you know, I could see that it would be reduced to the, you know, Harry slaps Hugo and then, you know, Rosie gets angry. You know, like it would, it would have been the, the, the most basic things, whereas actually some of the most beautiful things about the TV series have nothing to do with that. And, um, and fortunately, um, Christos understood that as well.